This is Tennessee Talks with United States Congressman Tim Burchett. Hello, I'm Congressman Tim Burchett, and welcome back to another episode of Tennessee Talks. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by my good friend, Jerry Vagnier. He's the CEO of McNabb Center, which provides mental health, substance abuse, social and victim services to folks all across East Tennessee, and most of those folks are in need, and they always seem to take care of a lot of folks for us. The McNabb Center was founded in 1948 after Helen Ross McNabb appealed to the Knoxville City Council to funds for a mental health agency for children. I guess that's got to be, you got to be careful what you ask for. They might end up naming it after you. And then everybody's calling you for the rest of your life. Hey, can you get, take care of this? And of course, now over 70 years later, the McNabb Center has 24 locations across East Tennessee and they provide mental health care, HIV education and treatment and substance abuse treatment and victim treatment among many other types of care. And these centers are uh, care for nearly 37,000 people every year, and they employ around 3,000 East Tennesseans. And Jerry, I want to say welcome to Tennessee Talks. It's great to have you on the show, brother. Thank you. It's great to be with you, and I appreciate the time. All right. Can you give us a brief history of the McNabb Center and what kind of services it provides East Tennesseans? Certainly. Next year, Congressman, we will celebrate our 75th anniversary, which is pretty astounding for any business, as you well know. But for a nonprofit mental health uh, center to have that kind of longevity in our state, we're really proud of that. And as you said, uh, Helen Ross McNabb herself uh, founded the organization really out of a spirit of just uh, seeing a need in the community that she wanted to meet. And we've really just grown ever since then, uh, and we tried to fill gaps in the community, and we've stretched our reach basically now from Chattanooga to uh, Newport. Great. You know, I remember when I was county mayor, I called one of the town fathers, so to speak, because we were getting ready to get uh, get in with y'all in, in a pretty big way. I felt like, and um, I remember he said, he said, he called me. He's known me since a little boy. He said, Timmy. He said, we do a lot of stuff through them. He said, and we've we've checked them fine tooth comb. He said, we've never, we've never found anything that they've misused funds or done anything. So that's a, that's pretty, in 75 years of service, that's, that's, that's strong. It is. That's strong. What made you want to work for McNabb Center? So I was a student intern uh, in the field of social work. I went to the University of Tennessee here at Knoxville and I did a placement there and I fell in love with their mission. They really were about trying to improve the lives of people that they serve. And I was trained to work ch with children and families formally. So the opportunity to be a child therapist, work with families in an organization that was growing was uh, kind of a dream come true. So I fell in love with it at that point. And I will say that we had a, uh, a executive director back then, Ken Bedell, and he was a very compelling and charismatic leader. And he, he drove that mission home. And uh, I bought it hook, line, and sinker. Well, good. I know you, you stated that you've had a, a, a strong faith in Jesus and it's influenced your decisions ever since you were a teenager. And I've tried to do that myself, although some people question it due to my, my chosen profession at this point. But, uh, <laughs> but how has your faith influenced your work with the McNabb Center? I've always looked at it as a, really a, an opportunity that my vocation and my personal mission were always in sync. So that was kind of the way that I've always saw that. And then I always re remember Matthew uh, 25, where it says we should help the least of these in our community. Not to say that people with mental illness or substance use are, are the least of these, but they are people who are marginalized in our community. And I've always felt like I uh, was responsible for trying to be their voice and hopefully get them some help and you know, those are the ones that God put in front of you amen and so that's uh you know you always think about what about all these others and I say well God put these right here in front of me I need that right. I should address that and I, right. I appreciate you saying saying that um you know we've seen a recent up uptick in shocking act of violence I mean you know it just seems more and more on the news and I'm not sure if it's more of that or just we're just more in tune to it. It's kind of like I remember when Jaws came out, everybody was like, wow, all of a sudden people were getting attacked by sharks. Oh, yeah. But in reality, people were always, always getting attacked by sharks. It just brought it to our attention. Yeah. But I know that, the, um, you know, with a lot of the mentally ill children out there and folks that, that these, um, that, that it happens to, it appears that it's happening more with younger folks. I'm wondering where your system, where our system, the whole system is failing these folks and enables them to get to that point to carry out these awful deeds. Mm -hmm. 
It's a, as you know, it's a really complicated issue, but I think a few things kind of stand out for me. One is, you know, they're inundated with information in ways that I didn't have to experience as a sure. young person. Uh, and then they don't have a lot of context for that. And then on top of that, a lot of these folks, if you look at their background, they had a lot of trauma in their lives and we didn't do anything to come alongside them and try to work our way through that. Yeah. So it snowballs and, you know, it doesn't happen to everybody who's been traumatized by any stretch, but it is a contributing factor. And it would be really nice if our society could identify people earlier yeah. and we could get them help when they needed help. Do you think COVID has had a lot to do with that? I noticed that, uh, I mean, the kids don't have really any outreach. And when they're locked in, it's the computer, it's the mm -hmm. screen. It just seems like there really is no human touch to it. And there is none. And now that they're sort of we're getting past that now. We're getting back into society where I think it's exposed a lot of uh, a lot of our flaws. Yeah. Um, I wonder what your thoughts are on that. You know, I think you're spot on. Um, in in my a lot of people in my family are educators, so I kind of have this firsthand uh, witness to it. That's mine. And uh, you know. W one thing we know, humans don't do well in isolation. We are social beings by creation. So uh, when that happens, that, that was bad. And then on top of that, you know, our school systems are sort of a safe haven for kids typically, where lots of teachers have eyes on. And if there is a problem, they help us identify that. In the absence of that, I think kids sort of spiraled a little bit and they didn't get identified, they didn't get helped. And it wasn't healthy for them. And so I'm really glad we're getting past it and that kids are back in an environment where it's normalized and they can kind of see each other and be with each other. Do you feel like there's some commonality between all this going on out there? Is there, is there one or two things we can say, hey, these are indicators or causes of this this type of activity, or is it just a broad, just different folks it affects differently? I think it does affect different people differently. People are biologically disposed. You know, they're, they have a history. Everybody's got a history that bring they bring to the table. So those things influence that. You know, one thing we do know in in, in the aftermath of COVID is anxiety and depression are up in our yep. population. Suicide is elevated in, I think in the last 20 years, it's a 30% increase, which is horrible for a developed country and with a health care system that really rivals anybody in the na in the world. So I, there are concerning uh, statistics out there right now that, that we ought to be paying attention to. And I think to some degree, Congressman, we finally have gotten the world's you attention. You Tim. You've known Tim. Long enough, Jerry. <laughs> Thank you. But we finally got the attention, I think, of the public to say that mental health and substance abuse is worthy of investing in? I agree. Really, you know, as in the thing. legislature, I would all, it was both sides, I'm a Republican, of course, and uh, but I would fight both sides for mental health funding mm -hmm. because, you know, it doesn't, it's, um, I always talk about the stigma, you know, you cut your hand and you don't think about going over to UT hospital emergency room and get, get it right. sewed up, but something going on inside your head is that stigma. And I have a lot of friends that that, that do suffer with mental health and we talk about it and you know it's like man you gotta you, you need to address it and it's just nobody cares it's, it affects right. so many people now that the stigma should be uh and i'm glad we're in some some avenues we're getting past that i think so um yeah, i had strong parents in my life i'm wondering and and they they knew when i was you know something was slipping up and i mean you know it's, it's, of course my dad was a dean at ut and i can always remember him punching in my social security number when I walked in his office and he already knew my grades before I did. So there wasn't any hiding there, <laughs> but the other roles of parents, um, um, just asking questions and being there. Of course, when I was a kid, you know, it was mostly mom and dads were at home. They had, or there was occasional single mom and, and they seemed to do very well. But now, you know, it's on, and some of these kids, they don't even have a mom in the home. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how, what kind of role does that play? We've got strong grandparents and strong, aunts and uncles and things like that, but that has to play a role in yeah. this. I think it does. So, and I'm recently a grandfather, which I'm pretty excited about. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, one of the things I like to say is I want to be a grandparent, but I don't want to be a co-parent with my kids child and I think that's the healthy balance now sometimes you just want to give them the mac and cheese and the mountain dew and send them home right? <laughs> I want to make and smiles happen that's yeah right. that's, that's right. right but in certain situations uh, grandparents really are honorably stepping in where parents weren't able to do it but that should be the exception parents should be able to, to parent their children raise their children provide structure for their children and love them unconditionally and, and good things happen when you do a few of those things well
tell me about the um, the communities that their involvement. What what can they do to help in this? I don't I don't think communities actually raise a child. I mean they, you know they they when I was a kid they kept an eye on things yeah. and now they're yeah. told to butt out. I guess. But I'm wondering what what can they do to um, to help prevent some of these acts of violence and things like that. I think one of the things that we're learning, and, and we still haven't figured this out by any stretch, Tim, but to pay attention to those around you and then to speak up when you see something that's an aberration. Right. If you see a child who's struggling, let's notify the school. Let's talk about them. Notify the parents or a neighbor. Uh, I think that's the first place to start. But, but to your point, there is some risk involved, right? I mean, because people want you to stay out of their business as opposed to the community, it's everybody's business. And I think we got to get back to some of that and, and take ownership for each other in that, right. in that sense. Some, some of these acts of violence, you know, you're hearing, why didn't somebody say something? Well, it turns out somebody did. And then somebody in government um, did not follow through. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, yeah. it's sort of a hand in glove thing. And I, I just, we're going to miss, you know, and, and the thing is, we're not going to know how many of these horrible tragedies we avoided because of people have stepped up, right. just the ones where we've, we've messed up. Yeah. Um, tell me, what are you most proud of McNabb Center? You know, I'm probably most proud of two things. The, the innovation, our organization really, really known for innovation. And I think that's because people are a bit right. fearless about trying things that are new. And I think they're fearless because the culture we built in the McNabb Center, which is all about team, right? And all about, sure. it's okay to fail. That's how we learn to get better. And I think those things come together. They're pretty cool. They're pretty cool to watch play out. And you would appreciate my third one. What we is? have no long-term debt at the McNabb sure. Center. I dig that, man. I tell you, that's I can't say that about a, about our federal government. But that's another. That's that's a whole story whole, for a different whole another day. dozen episodes. Well, I want to thank you for being here, Jerry. And I, but I want to ask you something. Um, I always ask let people do this. Um, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask me? Well, I'm curious about this one, and I've found myself being more and more interested in people being released from prison in, on a local level or trying to figure out what the solutions are for people who are incarcerated, substance abuse problems, come back to the community and help them out. But at a federal level, you know, we don't have a great success rate when we people don't. return to the community. And we know 95% of those in jail or prison, as we yeah. say, are going to get out. They're going to get out. Yeah. And they're either going to reoffend and go back, or we got to give them a different path. So I, I'm just curious what you think the federal government's position ought to be. Well, we actually filed legislation. Um, it's a bipartisan piece of legislation with a fellow named Hakeem Jeffries, and a lot of people East Tennessee are aren't aware of him, but he will be um, after Ms. Pelosi leaves at some point. Uh, he will be the, he's probably the number two guy in the Democrat leadership and he and I sponsored mm -hmm. legislation It's called prison to proprietorship. And there's a lot of, um, you know, you, you, a guy gets out of jail or prison and he goes to a job interview and he says, have you ever been convicted of a felony? Of course he or she lies, they catch oh, it, yeah. they're gone, but if they tell the truth, they probably don't get the job. And so, um, we're trying to smooth those edges out a little bit, allowing, um, uh, with entrepreneurs and th to work with those folks while they're in prison, and then when they get out, they um, you know they, don't, they can't get a checkbook, they don't maybe they yeah. don't have a social security number, or they don't know where it's at, or all these other things, and allows them sort of an entree into the business community prior to their um, getting in. And, and uh, you know, we're, we're going to have to get past some of the stigma. I mean, uh, we we are um, there go out of the grace of God, but a lot of people are in in jail honestly because they didn't have the proper representation mm -hmm. and um and and if the, you and i had committed the same crimes as some of these other folks we would probably have been able to find um representation that would that would have eased that blow just a little bit and so that um and those are things i've, I've, I've worked on and hopefully we can get some of that through the senate at some point and um, we've had good luck in the house but um we need somebody to take up our our mantle, so to speak, in the Senate. So hopefully we'll get that, and that'll that'll create some some good some good conclusion to some yeah. of these folks. But Jerry, I can't thank you enough for joining us here today. Uh, your work has helped thousands of East Tennesseans. We all know that who are in the most desperate of situations. I knew when I worked through y'all a little bit when I was in the state legislature, but when I was county mayor, you all definitely saved some lives. And I'm. And, and the verse you talked about in the Bible is something that, at least amongst us, I'm always thinking about that because that 
that's where the rubber hits the road. It does. And that's, you know, and it doesn't, and the, uh, they, they don't get the breaks you and I have, and we need to work towards that. But um, I just want to thank you so much for being here. And I'm Congressman Tim Burch, and I want to thank everybody for joining us for another episode of Tennessee Talks. And thank you all for sending me here. Thanks for listening to this episode of Tennessee Talks. Please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Keep up with Congressman Burchett by following Rep. Tim Burchett on Twitter and Instagram and Congressman Tim Burchett on Facebook and YouTube.